Hey, we are so glad that you made the decision to join us for our collective online experience. It means the world to us that you would choose to spend a part of your week with us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. How many of you love Jesus? Raise your hand. I love Jesus, and I love his church, and I especially love Pastor Alberto and Ashley. They're incredible leaders. You are blessed. I want you to know how blessed you are. You know, I, I oversee a lot of churches, about 1,200 pastors, and uh, you, have, you, have the, you have the best. I, I can't say that enough that God has blessed you, and it's good to see my Teen Challenge friends here, and and we're so thankful for the ministry of Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge save, helped save my younger brother's life. So I have a tremendous passion for, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to come share with you. And if you don't know, um, I'm humbled to be here. They make this big deal that I'm a superintendent. And, but uh, my grandparents came from Mexico. My dad was a gardener, and today I'm the superintendent of the Assemblies of God. <laughs> what a great God we serve. Matter of fact, I was born in a place called Bacoima, California. How many have ever heard of Bacoima? Anybody? Wow. There's people, and usually nobody's ever heard. How many have ever been to Bacoima? Everyone, everybody, everybody? Wow. And you're still alive. Uh, <laughs> that is a miracle because Bacoima is a rough place. How rough? I'm glad you asked me. Uh, legend has it that one time these four guys were driving in Bacoima. Well, that's not true. You don't drive in Bacoima, you cruise in Bacoima. And so they were cruising and they took a turn a little bit too fast and the car overturned and the four guys were killed. When they opened their eyes, they were in the presence of the pearly gates met by St. Peter. I did say this was a legend, right? And Peter says, what can I do for you gentlemen? Say, hey, we're from Bacoima, we like to come in. And Peter says, we don't have anyone from Bacoim up here in heaven. I'm going to have to talk to Jesus about this. So he goes and he talks to Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, we don't have anyone from Bacoim up here in heaven. Go get those four guys and bring them in. A few minutes later, Peter, Peter's running back to Lord, Lord, they're gone. He said, what, the four guys from Bacoim? No, the gates. <laughs> now, you have to be from Bacoim to tell that story. And I am from Bacoima, and there in that rough place in the San Fernando Valley, uh, my grandpa, who came from Mexico uh, with his nine children, found Christ as the Lord and Savior. And because he found Christ as the Lord and Savior, he was delivered from alcohol and called to be a minister of the gospel. Across the street from his house was a condemned dance hall. He buys it and turns it into a Pentecostal church. And at the age of five years old, I gave my life to Jesus in a condemned dance hall, and I've been dancing for Jesus ever since. So I feel real comfortable here in a theater, because I like my grandpa's church. And so I don't have a testimony on how to overcome drugs, because I've never taken drugs. So my younger brother was delivered from drugs and alcohol. I've, I've never taken a drop of alcohol. Well, that's not true. Every once in a while, I'll take a shot of NyQuil. We call that Pentecostal whiskey in our house. And, uh, but that's the strongest drink I've ever had. I've never gotten in trouble with the law. And you might think, well, what can you tell me? I can say this, that the promises of God are real. That the saving power of Jesus can keep you all the days of your life. And, and so as a young boy growing up, I used to say, God, I want to be like my grandpa. I want to know God the way my grandpa knows. I want to preach the way my grandpa. I want to love people the way my grandpa. I want to, he was my hero here, this immigrant from Mexico. who I think he learned, he learned English so he could speak to his grandson who couldn't speak Spanish. And, uh, and yet uh, I felt that God called me at a young boy's age, but I was always told it will never happen. I grew up in a Spanish-speaking church. I don't speak Spanish. It's a miracle that God used my life. I remember when my friends would feel a call to ministry, they would go to this Latin Bible college I applied. They rejected me. I was rejected. <laughs> now, I've been, you know, I've been kind of funny. Now, I, I've sat on the board of directors for that college, but they rejected me. Because uh, all my life, I've been told it'll never happen. Uh, it'll never happen. Matter of fact, some of you are here. 
Someone told you it will never happen. I know the testimony of Pastor Alberto, this uh, drug addict that, that uh, probably was told it will never happen. Uh, it, it, plant a church in the inner city of Baker. It will never happen. Do you know that 33% of all church plants fail after the first three years? People constantly tell us, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. You'll never be happy. You'll never be set free. You'll never have hope. You'll never. There's always people that will tell you it'll never happen. How many know when people say it'll never happen, God says, just watch me make it happen. But I'm here to say that all my life I've been told it would never happen. So, you know, I, I decide to go to Bible college. I'm, I don't know a single person in that Bible college. And there at Bible college, here I, I, feel, I feel unworthy. I don't feel smart enough. I, I don't know anybody. I, you know, people have told me it'll never happen. God can't use your life, all of this. And, but I had a vision of an angel. I had a vision of an angel. And she had blonde hair and blue eyes. And I knew it was an angel because there was no one with blonde hair and blue eyes in the church I grew up in. And I married that angel, and we've been married for 45 years to that angel. And uh, she wanted to be here, but the most beautiful grandkids, they need a grandma today, so that's where she's at. But uh, I said, I said, Connie, we're gonna, God's going to use us in a great way. God's going to use us in a great way. I really feel that together God's going to use us. And we graduated. This church asked me to be their youth pastor. And we were off and running in the ministry. My dream came true. Since a little boy, I was going now to be in the ministry and, and, and be like my grandpa. And... Uh, we were seeing God do amazing things, man. Young people were coming from the neighborhood, getting saved. And every Sunday morning, I would meet with the pastor in his Bible and his study. And my job was the ministry of the announcements. And that was like the only time I was going to get behind the pulpit. So, man, I used to preach those announcements. But I would really <laughs> preach those announcements because that was the only time I was going to get. And he sat me down. And he said, Rich, I hate to tell you, but uh, today is your last Sunday as our youth pastor. And so we decided that uh, we're going to make a change, and so you, we're going to walk out on that platform this morning, and we're going to tell the people, thank you, but this is your last Sunday. My wife was sitting in the front row, seven months pregnant with our first child, hearing it for the first time. It was like, God, what happened? What did I do wrong? I've lived for you all of my life. I've wanted to be a minister of the gospel. And now I'm out of the ministry. I used to call pastors and say, you know, I hear you're looking for a youth pastor. And they would say to me, uh, you're not the kind of youth pastor we're looking for. And my ministry was over. My father felt sorry for me. He was a gardener, and he would landscape homes. And he, he knew I was having a, a child, my first son. And, and he said, son, come work for me so that you can help pay for the birth of your child. And so there I am working for my father who I knew had broke his heart because he knew that God had called me to be a minister of the gospel. And, and my dad would landscape homes. He would landscape homes. The first thing they would do, it would just be all dirt, these homes. And they would load a, uh, they would order a skip load of steer manure and dump it on the, on the driveway with a little wheelbarrow and a shovel. My job was to spread that and steer manure all over the yard. And the only thing worse than steer manure is hot manure <laughs> because the fumes would get into my eyes. And I would be crying all day, not because of the manure, because I actually believed it would never happen. Maybe that's how you feel today. You'll never be happy. You'll never find love. You'll never be worth anything. It'll never happen. Let me ask you a question. How many believe we serve a God of miracles? Huh? Huh? How many believe this is a book of miracles? How many believe that? Then let me ask you a question. Why don't we see more miracles today? I travel all over the world. I just got back from Egypt, and I'm going to be going to Sri Lanka. Hopefully, Pastor Albert can come with me. Alberto can come with me to Sri Lanka. Everywhere we go in the world, we see tremendous miracles happen. Man, they line up for prayer, and God just miraculous. I say, God, why does it happen overseas? Why can't it happen here in America? Why can't it happen here in, in Bakersfield? Don't you think God loves Bakersfield as much as he loves Egyptians and Sri Lankans? Right, doesn't he? then why don't we see more miracles? I believe that the reason is not because of God, because we have, to kind of, we have to kind of prepare our heart for a miracle. 
And maybe today you need a miracle in your, in your marriage, in your finances. Maybe the doctors told you there's no hope for you, that there's nothing we can do. Maybe you've been told all your life you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be anything. I'm here to say that God is still a miracle-working God. But what does it take for God to do a miracle in your life today? How many need a miracle? Let me just say, you need a miracle. Well, you need a miracle in your relationship, your finances, your health. Well, you need a miracle. You just feel like you have no hope, no direction. You just need a miracle. God wants to do a miracle in your life. He wants to do it today. But what does it take for a miracle to happen? That's why we're going to go to the scripture, and it's found in Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 35. Jesus, at the height of his ministry, Jesus is on... He's on his way to the cross. Jesus has done miracle after miracle. And we get to this story in Luke 18, starting with verse 35. And it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And notice, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm here to tell you, friends, that we were all blind beggars at one time. We were spiritually blind. We were lost. We were all that way until one day we heard of this man named Jesus. And maybe you called his name out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This blind man, I'm sure he was blind since birth. I'm sure all his life he said, one day I'm going to see one day I'll be able to see the sun rise and the sun set. I'll be able to see my, my wife's face and my children's face someday. And I'm sure there are people in his life saying, it will never happen. You were born blind and you will die blind. But somehow he had hope because he had heard of this man named Jesus. And he called it out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you want a miracle in your life today, it starts with praying with passion. Did you hear it in his voice? He called it out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There was passion there. There was, there was emotion there. I think that's where you see the difference around the world that people come, they come desperate. They come because they're hungry, because they have no hope, and they come to Jesus, and they come with passion. Let me ask you a question. How many of you started eating your food and then wondered if you prayed or not? Come on, raise that chubby little hand with me, right? <laughs> Until you don't know where your next meal is going to come. Then all of a sudden you pray with so much passion, right? Or the doctor gives you some bad news and all of a sudden now you're here with some passion. God wants us to come into his presence with passion every time we come into the house. He's always here. He's always ready, but he's waiting for us. It's like a child. You can tell a child if he's just whimpering or if he's crying and he needs help. You can hear it in the tone of his voice. God waits for the tone of your voice. He wants you to pray with passion. The problem is we pray these God is good, God is great kind of prayers. We say the right things. We've been doing it so long, we can say it without even thinking. Matter of fact, the problem is we, 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 we don't even think about it anymore. But Isaiah or Jeremiah 29, 13 says that you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Half-hearted prayers don't cut it with God. God is waiting for your heart because that's where the emotion is. It would rather be praying with your heart and no words than with words and no heart. God is wanting us to come with passion to him. And maybe the only prayer you can pray this morning is help. God, I need help. My grandpa, who was a drunk, my, 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 he lost everything. My, my grandma saw this circus tent a couple of blocks from, the, from their house. She thought, I'm going to go find a moment of joy, a moment of peace. And she walks to the circus tent, but it wasn't a circus tent. It was a revival crusade. And she walks in that crusade, and she hears these words. Today you can be forgiven of your sin. Today you can be set free from what binds you. Today you can have new purpose and meaning in your life. And she accepts Jesus Christ as her Savior. She runs home to tell her husband, my grandpa. And he says, God is no friend of ours. God has never helped us. And I forbid you to go back to that tent. 
And she told him, if you go back, if you go back, I'm going to pull you out by your hair and embarrass you in front of all your friends. Being the stubborn little Mexican grandma that she was, she goes back the next night. They tell the story that my grandpa was so mad that, that he got his gun. He said, I'm, go, I'm going to, sh- before I drag that woman out, I'm going to shoot that preacher. I hope none of you came with a gun today. And as he's walking to that tent in his drunken, angry state, it starts raining like today. And it starts pouring rain. He gets inside the tent and he says, as soon as it stops raining, I'm going to shoot that preacher and I'm going to drag that woman out by her hair. And as he's sitting, standing in the back of that tent, he hears these words, today you can be forgiven of your sin. Today you can be set free from what binds you. Today you can have a new purpose and meaning in your life. And, and they said he started weeping in the back of that tent. He said, oh God, I've ruined my life. I ruined my marriage. I ruined my children. But if you'll give me one more chance. And he comes and he walks down a sawdust aisle, kneels at a sawdust altar. And in that tent service, he gives his life to Jesus. He's instantly delivered from alcohol. And he's called to be a minister of the gospel. What changed? He came with God with passion. I'm here today that God's waiting you to pray with passion today. We fall asleep on our knees and wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers. He's looking for passion. But that's not all. His blind beggar, not only you play with passion, you've got to pray with persistence. Notice what it says in verse 39 of Luke 18. Those who led the way, those who led Jesus, rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Think about it. The people that led Jesus told this blind beggar, keep keep quiet. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus can't help you. Isn't it amazing? There are always people around you telling you to keep quiet, that you can't can't change, that your situation is the way. they They want you to be as miserable as they are. But notice what it says. Those that led the way rebuked him and told him to keep quiet. But he shouted out the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Man, he shouted. Not only did he pray with passion, he prayed with persistence. The problem is we quit too soon. We pray one time. We say, well, I guess God did want it to happen. I prayed one time, you know, for a wife, and I didn't get one. Or I prayed for a job. I prayed for and it didn't happen. So I qu- you quit too soon. This guy wasn't going to quit just because they told him to keep quiet. He shouted out the more. Maybe you need a miracle, and you've been praying over and over. Maybe the next time God will bring them. But he's looking for your persistence. Is it to wake him up? Is it that maybe God isn't listening? God listens, but it shows him what you really care about. Uh, I've got seven of the most beautiful grandkids and you can ever imagine. That's why Connie is with them today. But uh, they already said, they call me Boo. They call me Boo. They said, Boo, uh, we've, got our, we've got our Christmas list on Amazon. <laughs> the, and they remind me every time they see me, Boo, did you look at my name? Why? Because they want to make sure I know what they really want. God wants to make sure what you really want. And it takes some persistence. <laughs> Why does it take some time? Because God is preparing you in the meantime. He would do it right now, but he's preparing you. The children of Israel had to wander for 40 days. They got to get their heart right. They had to get their minds right. They had to be in unity before they could go in the promised land. God is preparing you, but have you given up? Are you persistent? Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, keep asking, keep knocking, keep, keep seeking. Why? Because God rewards people who are persistent. Are you persistent today or you've given up? You've given up on your relationship. You've given up about your teenage son or daughter that is on drugs or away from God. You've given up. God is saying, come to me over and over again. Come with passion. Come with persistence. But the story's not over. That if you want a miracle in your life, you've got to pray with a single purpose. You've got to pray with a single purpose. The reason we don't see miracles happen because our prayers are too vague. Vague prayers give vague answers. I have people come to me all over my years of ministry, and they said, Pastor Rich, I've got this unspoken prayer request. And I say, okay, I've got an unspoken prayer. God bless you, go. (laughs) 
how can I pray? <laughs> or Lord, Lord, I, I, I want to be, I want to, I want you to bless me. What is a bless? Sometimes problems can be a blessing. You want more problems in your life? Notice our story in verse 40 of Luke 18. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. This blind guy knew exactly what he wanted. He knew exactly. This was his one shot. This was his one chance. He knew exactly. He didn't say, well, Lord, I'm, there's so many areas in my life that I need help. I'm out of work. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a house. No, he said, the one thing I need, Lord, give me my sight. What is the one thing you came here to do? What is the one thing you need God to do in your life? He's asking you today, what is the one thing that are you willing to confess to him that you need a miracle in your life? Maybe it's not drugs or alcohol, but it could be bitterness and unforgiveness. The things that are bound you, the things that keep you from having to joy and meaning and relationships, that's the one thing he's asking for. Your pride, your possessions, your perfume. He wants to be first in What is the one thing you need to give to God today? And James 4, 2 says, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. 20 times in the New Testament, the word ask ask he says ask and it shall be given to you ask you don't have because you don't ask why because vague prayers are lazy prayers we're, we we the longer we're christians the more we know the right things to say but we don't have the passion the persistence and we're not specific in our prayers what do you need God to do today? Come on. Is it finances? Is it relationships? Is it your health? Is it you, you've lost your joy? You've lost your vision? You can say, God, today I'm standing here. I'm going to hold on to this altar until you answer my prayer. He's looking for someone that has a single purpose. This blind guy said, Lord, I want to see. But not only did he pray with passion and he prayed with persistence and he prayed with a single purpose. If you want a miracle in your life, you got to pray with a positive attitude. In Luke 18, 42, it says, And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. He, his faith has healed you. He believed that Jesus could heal him. Do you really believe Jesus can set you free? Do you really believe that Jesus can save your family? Do you really believe that Jesus can heal, or do you doubt? <laughs> the people that God is using aren't the doubters, are people of faith. He says, your faith has healed you. And he, you might say, but, but Pastor Rich, I don't, I don't have a, a lot of faith. I don't have a lot of faith. Come on, let's be honest. We don't have a lot of faith. Let me give you, give you the answer. A little faith and a great God bring big results. A little faith and a great God brings great results. It's not the size of your faith. It's the size of your God. But if your problem is bigger than God, then you're not going to see that. But he said, Lord, heal me. Give me my sight. And he said, Jesus said, your faith or your positive attitude has set you free. You know, I preach in a different church. I know it's hard to tell because it's so dark. But uh, in this room, but uh, I preach in a different church every Sunday, and you would see the faces that I see. Ooh, man, it would, ooh, it would scare you. <laughs> and not this church, but some churches, Pastor Alberto. Uh, I, I think instead of water in the baptistry, they put pickle juice. Because of the sour looks I see on people's faces. Don't you think we should be the happiest people on the face of the earth? Don't you think we should have more joy than the drunk that stumbled out of the bar at 2 in the morning? It doesn't look at it because of our attitude. What's, what's affecting the church of Jesus Christ in America isn't the enemy from the outside. It's the division from the inside. I thought God called me to preach the gospel, and now I'm refereeing churches and boards and members. Why? Because they lost their positive attitude. I believe that uh, one man came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I need for my son to be healed. And Jesus says, do you believe I can heal him? And the guy said, Lord, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus said, that's good enough. He, he's healed. A little faith 
with a positive attitude. Maybe you, your attitude stinks today. We've got, I remember hearing a black preacher one time say, God ain't calling for more lawyers. He needs more witnesses. Man, I see so many people judging people rather than loving people because they've lost their attitude. Because of his attitude. Because he came believing. Because of his faith. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. So whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be yours. Notice, ask and believe. Ask and believe. But you say, Pastor Rich, how can I be more positive? How can I have more faith? The Bible says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. In other words, you got to get into this book. You know there's 7,000 promises in this book? 7,000. I would underline, circle, highlight every one of them and believe, God, you said by your stripes I'm healed. You said greater is he in me than he is in this world. God, you said that you shall supply all of my needs. Do you believe it? That's where faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all of your needs. Notice, not some of your needs. It didn't say the government will meet all your needs. He says, my, my God will meet all your needs according to His riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. You need a miracle today? Did you come with passion? Or are you thinking, man, I can't wait till this guy's over so I can get to lunch. You come with persistence. Well, you know, I prayed before and it didn't happen. You know, you know, and, you know it's like, you know, I, I ended up with, with this guy. Don't look at him, but you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so, you know, he's never going to change. You know, to, to, to come with a single purpose. Can you say right now, I need God to do this in my life today. This right now. And, it's, and let me just tell you, it's not going to be found in wealth. It's not going to be found in fame. It's going to be found in a living relationship with Jesus Christ today. If you don't have that, you're never going to find peace. You're never going to find this, this blind beggar could have been a millionaire, but there was still something lacking in his life. It wasn't just his eyesight, but it was a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you come with a positive attitude? But finally, the service isn't over. You got to pray with a spirit of praise. Notice in verse 43, immediately he received his sight, and notice these words, and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Notice this when he got his sight, when he got healed, because of his faith in Jesus, it says that he followed Jesus and he praised God. The result of a miracle, so that you should have faith in God and follow Jesus. I can't tell you how many people I've prayed for. God has done a miraculous thing in their life, and I never see them again. Thank you, God. You saved my marriage. You gave me a job. You did this. I'll see you when I have a problem. I'll come back again. Not this blind guy. He says he received his sight. He followed Jesus, and he praised God. It was so dynamic that everybody in that town said, we want to follow that same Jesus. What would happen if you went to work tomorrow because you received a miracle and you've made a decision to follow Jesus and praise God? Everybody you work with, everyone you go to school with, all your family members would see the transformation that has happened in your life through the power of God. They too would follow Jesus. You know, the sad thing is that... We don't thank him for the miracles he does until we're in trouble again. But Philippians 4, 6, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Over 550 times in the Bible, the word praise is written. You, gotta, you forgot how to praise God. You praise him through the good times. You praise him through the bad times. You praise him. I'm shoveling manure. I'm shovel manure, man, and I'm doubting God. I'm doubting myself. I'm thinking, God, why are you punishing me? I'm th maybe I was never called. Maybe I made this up. Maybe I just made this up. And uh, every day I would come home and come through the back door. And my wife Connie would make me take off all my clothes except my boxers. It's not a pretty sight. Don't visualize it. <laughs> because I reeked of steer manure. 
I walk through the kitchen into the living room. It's Christmas time. And there she's holding my two-week-old son. (laughs) He's 42 years old now. I don't even have enough money to go buy a Christmas tree. Not only do I feel like a failure as a, as a minister, I feel like a failure as a father. And I see her sitting there holding my, my son, and some worship music is playing, and, and she's praising God. She's, she's praising God, singing. And I'm thinking, what's your problem, woman? What are you worshiping God? I shovel manure for a living. She said something I'll never forget. She said, you've forgotten your promise. Oh, don't you hate it when your wife tells you something you don't want to hear. (laughs) It was a dagger in my heart. She knew, and I knew what she meant. I don't know if you were raised in a Mexican home or someday you'd like to be raised in a Mexican home. (laughs) Can I see your hand out there? I see your hand. I was raised in a Mexican home. And every Friday night, we had dinner with Grandpa and Grandma. I loved it. He was my hero. Uh, But when we got to his house, we couldn't go through the front door because on the porch, there was a line of people waiting to be prayed for by my Grandpa. He would pray for each one of them as long as it took. He was such a loving man. And so we'd have to go through the back door and the back door was the kitchen, and there in the kitchen was my grandma. She was always in the kitchen, and she was always cooking. Oh, I can smell the tortillas and beans even as I speak right now. <laughs> and I said, Grandma, where's Grandpa? I just assumed he was in the living room praying for people. She said, no, me, oh, he ain't in the living room. He's in the shed. I said, well, is he fixing bikes? My grandpa would find broken down bikes and fix them and give them to kids in the community who couldn't afford a bike. <laughs> My grandpa was city serve before there was a city serve. <laughs> so no me, he ain't fixing bikes. He's praying. I said, how long has he been praying for? He said, he's been praying for three days, locked in a shed. As a young boy of seven years old, I remember pressing my ear to that door of that shed hearing a man of God pray. Now, I don't speak Spanish, but I understand Spanish. So if you say something behind my back, I know what you're saying. (laughs) And whether it was in a restaurant or at the dinner table or in a shed, he started his prayers the same way. And it went something like this. Bendito Padre, Santo del Cielo y Tierra, Padre mío. And I knew that man near the door of that shed had a direct line with God as he prays for his nine children by name who all came to Christ. He prays for their spouses. He prays for their grandchildren by name. He prays for their great-grandchildren by name. And as he's praying, he mentions my name. He says, dear great God in heaven, use my grandson to be a preacher of the gospel. May you take him around the world. Oh, I wish you could have come with me to Liberia and Sierra Leone. I wish you could come with me to Cuba, to Haiti. To... He says, God, use him. At seven years old, I knew what I was going to do the rest of my life. But I had forgotten my promise. Maybe you forgot your promise. I know what you're thinking. I wish I had a grandpa like that. Well, today, friend, if you'd press your ear towards heaven's shed door, you can hear your heavenly Father call out your name. Today, you can be forgiven of your sin. Today, you can be set free from what binds you. Today, you can have new purpose and meaning in your life. Connie had to remind me, so I sat next to her. And together, we were worshiping God with our two-week-old son. I said, God, if I I never get back into the ministry, if I never become a pastor, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to live for you, God. I'm going to because, God, that's what you called me to do. What do you need today? 
today, believe God that the miracle that you're praying for will happen. It can happen this morning, but do you have the passion? Do you have the persistence? Do you have the single purpose? Do you have a spirit of praise? If that's you, I believe today is your day for your miracle. How many would say, Pastor Rich, I need a miracle today? Come on. I want you all to stand to your feet. Could you all stand? In a moment, Pastor Alberto is going to come and lead you in prayer. But the, the, who's the hero of the story? Jesus, right? Right? Jesus is the hero of the story. Let me tell you another hero of the story. The person who brought that blind man to that gate. He couldn't get there by himself. Someone cared enough for this blind man to bring him where Jesus was. You have blind friends, bl spiritually blind family, spiritually blind co-workers. They just need to meet Jesus, that you can bring them, that they too can say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You need a miracle today? Come on, lift up your hands with me. I don't think this altar is big enough. But my grandpa found his place at an altar and he was forgiven of his sin. He was set free from alcohol and he was called to be a minister of the gospel. And the line of alcoholics were, were done because of one man's decision that I've come to faith in Jesus, that my three kids have come to faith in Jesus, that my seven grandkids because of one man's decision. What would happen today if you gave your life to Jesus? What would it do to your marriage, to your family, to generations that would follow you today? Just say, Jesus, I come to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I'm blind, God. I'm spiritually blind. Open my eyes. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Jesus. Set me free from those things that are binding me. You said, greater is he that is in me that's in this world. Lord, I believe that by your stripes I'm healed today. You said you would provide for all of my needs. God, I come to you with a single purpose. And God, give me a new future. God, for my family, for my marriage, for my children. God, let me see. Give me a glimpse of how you're going to use my life. Lord, I thank you that on that couch with my wife, you once again you gave me a glimpse of my future. You gave me a glimpse of the lost people of Bakersfield, of Fresno, of Los Angeles, of San Diego, of the world. You gave me a glimpse of those that need Jesus. Thank you, God that the next day I got a call from a pastor I never heard of, from a city I never heard of. You brought me back home. Thank you, God, for 42 years. I want to just give you all the glory. That can be your story today by just calling his name. Would you just lift up your arms? Now everyone stand. Just lift up your arms. Just thank Jesus. Just praise him. Just give him thanks that God's going to do a miracle in your life today, right now. Thank you for joining us for this week's message. We hope that you are encouraged and inspired by what God is doing in your life. So we want to remind you that you can give to our ministry by visiting our website. And hey, we would love to have you join us in person. We have two service times at 9.30 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. And we would love to see you there. See you next week.